Okay, so let's get started. Um, today's topic for the lecture is um, data science in retail. So we're going to be talking about, you know, we discuss what retail is and how it, how it works. And um, then we'll discuss uh, from the data science perspective, we'll discuss uh, regression modeling and go into some technical details there. So first of all, um, what is retail? When we say retail, um, we, we understand this a sale of various goods and services through various distribution channels directly to consumer. So pretty much retail, it means direct to consumer sale, whether it's happened through the store, through the catalog or you know, online. In general, we can distinguish several retail segments, right? Um, one segment, very, very big segment is a uh, grocery and food retailer. Um, and that also includes what's called CPG or F and FMCG. CPG stands for consumer packaged goods and uh, FMCG is fast moving consumer goods. Um, then um, there is a, like fashion, apparel department stores. Um, then there are specialty retail like pharmacies, you know, travel stores, hardware stores, and then there are restaurants, cafes, fast food. So pretty much everything where we sell directly to consumer. Now, there is a sort of separate, uh, one, one of the entities is um, CPG, FMCG. Um, they, they are very much of an interest for uh, data science and they need data science because um, these are those um, the, that retail where you actually have a very high volume of uh, and, and quick turnaround. So it is where you do have a lot of consumers and a lot of purchases where products have quite short shelf life. And um, maybe this is typically a, low price and lower margins. And uh, so in, in this case, um, you really can benefit from all kind of uh, analytics, predictive analytics. Now, in order to understand how retail operates, let's take a look at uh, retail supply chain. So everything start with supplies of goods and services. Then there is of course, um, logistics where you, we actually deliver it to distribution centers. Now, distribution centers can be a lot of those. Then from those distribution centers, there's again, um, what's called outbound logistics that brings it to the stores. Now in stores, we usually think about like backroom and shelf where shelf is um, the consumer facing part and backroom is sort of, you know, storage. Um, and then a uh, consumer interacts and picks up uh, products from the shelf. Now, what's interesting here is that, yes, the product goes here left to right, but um, the information and the management of the process is actually going from right to left, um, sort of from the consumer all the way through this uh, supply chain, because eventually it's the consumers who pays money, right, who purchases. And depending on uh, demand, um, the, the job for a retailer is to understand and, and provide the supply. And to provide supply, you need to actually go back along this um, supply chain with the information, um, requesting certain amount of goods to be stored in the store. Um, and then they had to be delivered from a supplier to distribution centers. So to do this, uh, you need to do um, a lot of sort of numerical simulation um, to figure out uh, demand, right? To predict demand uh, based on the demand you want to understand how much of the supply you need. And then uh, category management means figuring out what type of goods you need to deliver, what categories of goods you need to deliver. So, Within this you know, supply chain and value chain, um, we can think about various use of analytics. 
and, and, and data science. So first of all, if you think about logistics part and you notice there's a lot of transportation of course involved within the retail, we're talking about um, optimal routing, um, optimal transport optimization, um, location of the distribution centers um, and, and, and so on. You know, whenever you provide the inventory, um, you need to understand how much to order and then you need to manage it in the sense of you don't want to skip too much um, because that's actually sort of you know waste or you don't want to have it too little so that uh, your supply meets the demand. Then there is, of course, uh, from production logistics, we go to category management, which means you want to understand what's needed. Um, you need to figure out the right assortment of the products and um, optimize and localize it, which means depending on the locations, for example, you know, what type of goods deliver to which stores. Um, then, um, of course, the, the big question is, um, you know, what's, um, how, you know, what, what to do with, with the pricing. Now, um, moving to the right on this picture, there is also the, the notion of, you know, physical stores, if uh, we sell it through this, through the brick and mortar stores, then of course it is where uh, you locate those stores, um, store management, um, store workforce, shift schedule optimization. So finding um, the optimal uh, schedule for, 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 um, for, for, the, for the customers, for the store workforce, right? Um, and, and then there could be problems or can, can be an interesting problems to solve, which is store layouts of how to optimally place uh, the products within the store. Um, then, of course, with switching, you know, to the right side, um, more of um, customer stuff. So, you know, here on the left, it was more about um, sort of operations of the store. On the right, here, this is more about customers. And here within the customers, customer uh, related, uh, intelli um, you know, AI or data science, um, we're thinking about um, such tasks as um, actually building recommendation aid engines um, to recommend consumers. Um, then there is, uh, of course, um, understanding how to provide promo promotions, um, build loyalty programs, um, prevent customer churn. So work around like marketing tasks. Um, and then finally, uh, um, you know, when, when we sell, when retailers sell, um, there are tasks related to you know pricing, which is what the optimal price. Um, what's what are the promos? Um, upsell and cross sell, which means upselling means provide providing the same type of um, goods, but sort of a more premium quality for the higher price. And cross selling is uh, providing um, you know goods to buy together with what you're buying. Um, smart markdowns, um, this is a way to mark down the prices. So there are all kinds of tasks here um, that includes um, uh, the, the prediction and optimization problems. And, uh, you know, the reason data science and analytics works really well and the reason it is in a very high demand um, within the retail sector is because of the volume uh, overall of assortment, right? So there's like 10 of thousands of types of goods being sold and the entire volume of sales, which means sort of number of transactions and number of customers. So it is really sort of big data problem in the sense of lots and lots of um, you know, information and transactions that happens here. So you really cannot do a lot of computations here by hand. So, you know, to, to drive this data decision, data driven, to have this uh, data driven decision making, um, as you said, um, you know, on the operation side or supply side, uh, when we're talking about sort of uh, logistics and sales, you know, we're talking about problems like demand forecasting, um, which is a 
time-dependent prediction problem. Then there is a sales forecast. Um, then there is inventory and category management. Then optimizing store locations. Then there is price optimization, um, computing price elasticity and markdown, um, or like how we reduce prices or how we provide promotions. And then overall supply chain optimization. So these are like type of data science problems you deal with on uh, sort of operation side or supply side of the store. Then uh, on the customer demand side, um, we're talking about, first of all, uh, marketing uh, and marketing and sales, right? And here the interesting problems are in personalized marketing. So um, when, what, and, and how to deliver the message. Um, then of course, like recommendation engines, next best offer, what to offer next to the client, to the customer. Um, market basket analysis is analysis of the purchasing and um, offering um, cross-sell and upsell. Then there is a problem, there, there is a propensity to buy. So the, the sort of the probability of, of somebody to buy items. Um, the loyalty programs, construction optimization, um, sentiment analysis, customer reviews and responses. But, you know, we need to understand that prediction drives up to, so optimization so prediction drives optimization to actually optimize um costs uh, and, and revenue and um the reason you know there is a the prediction is needed is because if we optimize on today's um information will optimize for today and what we want to do is optimize for uh tomorrow right because that's where we can um uh, change things and um also, it's important to understand that um, though, you know, this is sort of the operation side is a backbone of uh, retail. In fact, uh, a lot of decisions there and information that's given there and models are driven by um, the customer because the ultimate goal is to sell and, and um, earn revenue. And so um, then this, the, the marketing that uh, all this models are actually predicting um, and, and, and driving the demand. And then um, the supply side need to satisfy this demand. Okay. So within that, uh, what type of data do we have in retail? Well, there are usually you know, two types two major types of data. There is a sort of the sales data, um, so which is the data on, on sales, uh, where you know we have time, we have store, we have SKU, which is um, which is short for stock keeping unit. Um, it's just sort of category unit. Um, then of course you know the, the, the amount of money, um, the price. Um, and then there is another side, um, you know, a lot of data is being collected in CRMs, um, customer relationship management software, where it is indexed by customers. And, uh, you know, if there is a loyalty program, there's usually a customer ID um, and, and dates and type of purchases and amount of money spent. Um, if there is no loyalty programs, it can be indexed to credit card numbers or some other way. Plus on top of it, um, there is usually data on promotions. So what kind of promotions has been uh, done in what location? Um, there is a marketing data, you know, all kind of external data. So in retail, is, is the retail is sort of washed in, in, in data. Um, uh, you know, we're going to talk over a few examples of what uh, and how models can be used in retail. Um, and then we'll focus on the, some you know, techniques for uh, regression modeling. Now, here is an example, uh, and, and this is, these examples are illustrative examples just to show you some of the complexities you have when you deal with um, retail data. Um, for example, let's talk about inventory management. So the idea of inventory management is that you need to have in stock enough um, items, right, enough inventory to satisfy uh, the demand. But what you want to make sure is that, you know, you're minimizing, um, you know, holding uh, costs, which is, uh, you know, holding and storage costs, which is, you know, amount of money you pay for storage. Um, 
uh, shipping costs um, because you don't ship like constantly, you ship um, you know, items in, 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 in groups. And so what you want to do is, and you always want to have some sort of safety stock, which is some amount of, of items available for the customers because um, otherwise, uh, you know, if, if demand exceeds supplies, exceeds your safety stock, um, people will not be able to buy what they want to. And that, in, in that case, not only loses um, the, the sales at the moment, but also sort of the loyalty of the customer. So, um, also we need to take into account that when you order things, um, you, don't, you don't order it like daily, you order it for some periodicity. Um, and the question is how often you need to order and, and, and the volume of the orders. So to do that, you really need to uh, build it from the demand side. So what we have, we have, what we see here is sort of simulated demand, which is of course changing, right? Um, demand for, for a particular store um, on, on some product type. And then on the next, uh, the second one is that's what we want to, for example, to predict. We want to predict um, the dates and the volume of orders. Now, if we have, because of that demand, if we look at the inventory, inventory can drop, then when the order comes in, it returns and it drops and it returns, it drops, it returns. So the idea is to make sure that inventory never hits sort of zero level, because that means, you know, if there is next customer comes and all of a sudden they want to purchase the product, the product is not available. And so then, um, the data science problem here is to find out when to um, make a delivery, right? And, and um, this is optimization problem. So you want to be able to satisfy, um, make sure your inventory never hits zero, but at the same time, you do have the holding costs, storage costs, shortage costs, and, and um, you know, you, you still, uh, you know, paying upfront for, for often for the goods you, you get. So that's, for example, the problem of inventory management. Um, another typical data science problems is to evaluate effectiveness, efficiency of the promotions um, that, uh, for example, you do in the store. So you would think that this is very easy because um, you, know, you just compare, it's sort of A-B testing, right? Um, you compare how much, what the volume of, of, of or the, with the revenue you, you, you make um, if you're selling at um, their predetermined price or um, the, if you provide a promotion, then due to this promotion, um, you know, the price drops and uh, you, um, you know, the, because of that, uh, the volume, the number of, transactions increases, right? The volume of sold goods increases. And so, you know, eventually you get some additional sales um, due to this promotion. And you might think that that's okay. That's the result of the promotion. But in fact, uh, if we start looking into, you know, additional money made through the promotion, like the effectiveness of promotion, it's not that easy, right? To compute, there are many, many factors need to take into account. So this uh, done to, to calculate the net effect of your promotion. Let's say, look at this um, diagram. Let's say we have um, uh, the, the amount of, uh, you know, let, let's say, look at the sort of sales that we would have if um, we were sort of at the base um, and, and we didn't have a promo. And let's say this is additional volume we sold due to the promotion, but um, that's sort of additional money we make due to the promotion. But let's see um, what we do need to take into account to calculate the actual um, effect. Now, we're looking at this left to right. So first of all, um, on each, if we if we add, you know, if we create discount, um, if we you know have a discount, then uh, we actually. Um, you know, give away some money, right? And this is a discount. So we made sort of additional um, revenue 
but uh, there was a discount. And so in fact, we uh, got less money, but it gets even more interesting. Uh, we have, uh, we, we change it, you know, cross sales. Well, a cross sale is really meaning um, how much we um, in fact uh, lose due to the cross sell, which means uh, somebody um, can purchase um, additional items from the different categories. And so we get some cannibalization. For example, um, you know, when the consumer switches to the promotion, uh, it, it's not buying sort of some alternatives. Um, and then there can be other promotion running at the same time. Uh, and you ignore, the customer ignores that because of this promotion. So you kind of, by creating promotions, um, there's a globalization of sales, both um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of regular sales with the same category and in terms of uh, other promotions. And so the effect of the promotion eventual effect is actually much smaller than what seems um, at first. So, um, and, and that can be calculated, right? That, that sort of modeling can be done, but again, requires um, some data science skills. Um, then let's talk a little bit about uh, marketing side of the things. Um, and, you know, one of the big, uh, of course, you know, there are, there are two functions, right? One function is acquiring customers and the other one is uh, retaining customers. So, you know, the customers are being attracted and retained because of, to, to the particular retailer because, you know, multiple factors, right? Um, it can be, uh, first of all, you know, prices and discounts um, that the retailer provides um, it is assortment of the product, and so it's convenience. Um, it is retail brand, um, you know, sort of that, that, that's a very powerful thing. It is location of the store, um, and it's also loyalty programs. And so we're going to focus a little bit on loyalty programs. So um, loyalty programs are, are, you know, designed to you know, sort of build and support customer loyalty. And by loyal customers, we we are we thinking about the customers that are returning customers, the frequent buyers that uh, you know bring a large check um, to bring a lot of profit to the store, and um, you know we all have seen have had all those uh, you know store cards um, that are part of those loyalty programs. So what um, are they being used for? Well, um, it is first of all you know in order to build consumer profile such that later on you can provide some personalized experience. Um, it is of course to collect data about the, you know, the, the store performance and, and uh, you know, overall sales. And um, it's actually to create some actions, um, targeted actions to increase the loyalty, to keep the customer and to provide individual offer to the customer. But then there is always a question, if we want to do that, like which customers are actually valuable for, for their retailer? Um, and, and here, uh, the, the sort of the standard uh, definition, the standard approach is through customer lifetime value, uh, which is CLV or CLTV. Sort of in, in, in plain English, it's uh, the revenue that the customer brings to the company, to the retailer in this case, over the period of uh, relationships, so through through like the time when customer buys stuff. Sort of if we're thinking about um, average computations, right, or or even computing its sort of average CLV or uh, for one customer or for all the customers, it's usually calculated as a product of what's called customer value and average customer lifespan. So average customer lifespan, this is literally, you know, how long the customer is um, with, with the retailer and customer value. It is typical 
uh, purchase value, so how much money spends and how frequently um, it, it does it. So you know, overall, CLV is, is, is defined literally as how much money customer brings you know, times um, the, the customer, typical customer lifespan. Uh, this is very sort of you know, very, very generic uh, definition. Um, and if you want to work on a um, much more uh, precise, much more discrete level, uh, you would think about calculating this uh, for individual customers, computing, for example, not an average customer lifespan, but for each particular customer, calculating the city difference between uh, the distance between the first and last um, purchase and computing you know, all the value that the customer brought um, to the retailer. Now, the challenges here are in that, you know, in, in, in sort of the middle of the life of the customer, well, you, you don't know when it's gonna be sort of next purchase, right? Um, so it is interesting to build models here, predictive models that based on the historical data and historical um, customer behavior type to try to predict um, you know, lifespan or even better predicting CLV itself. Um, and it's also important for new customers, for those who you do not have um, a lot of uh, data on. And, you know, in the, in the homework, um, you'll be asked to actually, uh, given data, transactional data, uh, you'll be asked to predict um, COV uh, for customers. Okay. So these were examples um, of, of uh, data science in retail. Now we're gonna be using those examples to actually talk about um, your technical side of things or um, regression modeling. So kind of switching gears and going more into uh, data science. So um, just to remind you, when uh, we do you know, data science modeling, we always in uh, the simplest scenario, we split our data into train and test set where on the training set, we use uh, the data to train the model, and then we compute training error, and on the test, we verifying it. Now, we also talked previous, in the last lecture that um, we might split it into train, validate, test. Right now, for simplicity, um, you know, I will look only into training and testing split, but the, the, the idea is preserved through the split into three models. Now, why is this important? Why do we do this training and test split? Well, the reason is the following, that when we have our entire data, you know, the, the, the all possible data, you know, in the world that, that we can model, um, when we train the model, we don't train with all the data. We just pick up some sample, um, you know, we train the model, and then we expect that the sample is very much representative of what's happening in the real world. So these are the sort of the distribution, the data points are representative um, for what's happening in the real world. And then the model will actually generalize. So will work well, uh, we'll do the right predictions for any data points. So pretty much, you know, we picked up a few points here and there, collected, formed the sample. And then we're saying like, look, for all other data points, the model will apply. And so this is a very strong assumption. And so then the idea of training and testing is actually that um, to verify this assumption, right? So that, you know, we kind of pick up some points that we use to train, and then we pick up some other points, independent points that we're gonna test on. And so that will give us understanding of um, how model will perform you know, so to speak, in the wild. Now, it still does not give you guarantee that it will perform on all the uh, unseen data um, the same way as on a test set, but it gives us better understanding of what's gonna be happening in the, out there versus just on the training. Again, training is some data that model already seen and test, it's a data that model hasn't seen. And you will see that, of course, the error 
because the, the, the model never seen that data, the error on the testing data will be typically larger than on the training data. And you know, that's the way it should really be. So um, we're gonna talk a bit about regression today. Um, we, you know, we already looked at this example when we have a bunch of data and you know, we, we want to do a regression and here is a simple um, you know, straight line regression. So the question is, how do we actually evaluate the quality? Yeah, you know, there are some very, very straightforward and simple ways to do it. Um, if we have a bunch of data points and let's say we are uh, doing a regression, regression means for each data point, uh, you know, we can predict a value to the regressor. And so we take up this data point, this um, X value, this is what um, the regression predicts. So this is how much we sort of missed compared to, we over that overestimated compared to the real value. Or we take um, this point, um, this is the actual value, this is what's being predicted by straight line regression, by linear regression. Uh, you know, this is how much we um, underestimated value. And so we do the same thing for all the points. And so we can calculate, we can just sort of look at this at length of this length of those under and over estimation and can calculate, add them up, calculate the error. And that's called actually mean um, absolute error. Um, another metric is mean squared error, pretty much the same idea, um, except for taking just the length, um, we, we adding squared and you know, the most sort of famous is RMSC, right? So it's root mean square error, which calculates those distance squared sum taking square root of it. Now in regression, we, we often use the metric called R squared. Um, this is the ratio over the residuals, which is the values, the prediction minus um, the actual values divided by the variance in the data. So how much sort of variance is within the original um, data. And the R squared, is uh, you know is, is 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 such a metric that when you have a sort of perfect model which fits um, the data really you know hits the data perfectly r squared is equal to one um, and um, when we sort of pick up the baseline model and baseline model means we just uh, look at the average of all the, all the data then. Um, R squared um, will, will, will be um, zero, right? Um, so that's sort of a relative metrics. You know, sometimes absolute value is not very clear and you want to have a relative metric and relative metric you know, is R squared. So people talk about R squared being, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.7. And, and so based on that, either uh, trust the, the model or not. So um, following the discussion we take, let's say this is our uh, regression data and we split it into two, uh, into the train and test. And so the model will be trained on the blue data points, which is like 80% of the data we have um, and tested on the 20%, right? The green points. So, and again, the idea is that we're trying to simulate um, Sort of picking up, you know, and we're trying to understand how well the model will generalize towards the unseen data, and so the error, the sort of that that we would expect um, in the real world, um, it's the error that the model shows on on of course unseen data, so on the test set. So here's an example. Um, now, of course, you know, by looking at this data, we understand right now that the straight line is not, you know, the, the, the perfect mapping for this data set, but still, you know, we can calculate both errors, train and test. And uh, just to remind you how we do this, this is just sort of the distance, you know, from the points to the line, right? Um, and the train error, 906, uh, the test error is larger, which, you know, the way it, it, it should be, um, again, because the model hasn't seen and what, and, and the green points were not used 
to calculate the straight line on the blue points. Okay, let's see if we go for more um, complicated model. Um, so instead of uh, linear regression, we can use polynomial regression and we can use uh, various um, values uh, you know, for the polynomial. So we can use sort of squared polynomial of the fifth degree and 10th degree. And so you know, the, the higher um, the degree, sort of the, the, the more variability the model has, right? And uh, you know, in, in some sense, the better it fits um, the, um, the, the data. Um, and here you might notice um, that the error, in fact, um, you know, of course, you know, the, the test error is um, above the train error, the test error is above the train error, the test error is above the train error. But you might also notice um, that, for example, here um, we have where, you know, the train error reduces, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, getting better. And, and, and the test error is getting better. But here, when we have our, you know, too much wiggling in, in, in the model, it's actually start going up, right? So um, we know you're seeing this, this behavior. Um, that tells you that, you know, there is a sort of, you can choose, you know, the, 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 the level of sort of polynomial regression or the complexity of the model by you know, checking the data, the, checking the, the error and you do this, of course, um, you know, that's why you use say validation sets. But let's move further and look at some more modeling. Now, another model, the regression model is called k regression, which is, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's k nearest neighbors. So for every point you select um, k nearest neighbors and based on, on, on that, um, you average and, and calculate um, the value. Now, notice what happens here. Um, when k equal to one, um, you know, the train error is zero. So, uh, you know, what, what, what does it mean? Well, uh, k equal to one, your model is actually goes, so your model is your, your data points, right? And so your model, if you wish, um, goes through each data point. Of course, train error is zero, but for the test, is where we approximate and uses this model for previously unseen um, data points. Well, the test error is uh, pretty large, right? Um, then we have, uh, you know, we can we can increase the size of the neighborhood, you know, five nearest neighbors, ten nearest neighbors, and you know, of course, we'll get some train error. You know, the, the test error, of course, will be um, will will be worth. Yet another um, modeling method is a regression trees. So where we actually trying to build a tree, um, but the tree is a regression tree, which means um, in the leaves of the trees, we actually use uh, numerical values. So um, the way to do this is that we, you know, select sort of a, a point, well, it's automatically selects a point that splits the data, divides the data, and then, uh, you know, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you use your data points and you average the values and you represent all the data uh, on the left-hand side with the average value on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side with an average value um, from the right-hand side. So here, the split is happened at 42. Here it is, here's a split, and what's to the left will be, will have the average value around 20, and what's on the right, um, average value around 17. So that's, that's how you build this model. So if you want to go and build a Diba tree, um, then you get more splitting points, and then, you know, within those regions, so we, the splitting points split um, model into now in, in into um, four regions um, one two three four and for each region um, we have an average value and obviously that if we can continue doing this we eventually get 
to the point where um, our presentation is uh, pretty detailed, right? Um, and uh, you know, we, we can now have this regression tree and we can measure the accuracy. And so, uh, you know, this is a tree and also notice what happens with, with error. And I, I think this is very, you know, this is very sort of an instructive example. Um, notice that, of course, we, you know, get deeper and deeper uh, trees, uh, which are reproducing the data sort of more, better and better, the trading data. But what happens also is that, um, you know, as, as far as we go from the left to the right, and we increase the complexity of the model, right? We're going from the depth two to depth four to depth eight. So there was sort of bigger and bigger tree, the model getting more and more complex and complicated. What happens is, you know, on one hand, your train error is dropping, right? It's dropping, you're actually reproducing or approximating the train data better and better. You're becoming more and more accurate um, prediction on the train data. But notice what happens on the test data. On the test data, that was an error. Then it drops down. But then it goes up. So what it tells us is the following. As we go left to right and increase the model complexity, the train error, if I plot an error, the train error will be dropping. But the test error at first, at first drops, but then it first drops, but then goes up. And the reason for that is because of what we call overfitting, right? Where you actually start capturing not the sort of essence, this, this essential um, dependency in the data, but more like the noise that is present there. And remember that the error that you will observe in the real world, right? After you take your model and then use it in the real world is, is much closer to the test error than to the train error. And so you would expect um, your model perform with this quality. And so based on that, you can, you know, you, you would be selecting this type of model because this model gives us um, the optimal uh, test error. So um, here is one more example. Now it's with ensembles of, of the trees where you have uh, not a single tree, but multiple trees. And um, the way ensemble works is um, we get uh, uh, each tree makes its own prediction and then ensemble averages it out. And so in this case, um, you know, we get a train error and, and, and test error again train error is less um, than test error. So in summary, um, I think this is the important message here. Whenever you try to build, um, say, regression, and it's, 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 it's similar, actually, story with, with classification, so with all supervised um, learning models, is that um, when you compute the model, we evaluate the quality of the model. Um, there are really sort of two uh, quality metrics. One is your error computed on the training set itself. So, you know, you, you use the training set to calculate model parameters, and then you calculate um, error on the same data. And in that case, when you take the model and make it more and more complex, usually training, um, usually the error on the training set will be decreasing. So eventually when you make a very complicated, uh, very, very, very flexible model, you can actually drop your training error almost to zero. And um, you know, model complexity really means, okay, deeper trees, um, sort of model complexity increase means you're gonna get deep, 
more deeper trees where you'll get, um, if it's polynomial model, you get, um, you know, high degree polynomials that are used, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where model complexity, what model complexity is. So, and if you make a very complicated model, again, think about polynomial, um, very high degree polynomial can actually perfectly, eventually can perfectly fit, almost perfectly fit your, your, your trading data. Um, and, and then the error will be zero there. But it doesn't mean your model will generalize well because it actually most likely will learn uh, noise and will not be able to perform well on unknown data. So the real test is how your model performs on the unknown, un previously unseen data, which in the case of modeling is a testing data. And so what you would observe is as you increase the model complexity, at first testing data, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> error on the testing data will be uh, decreasing. But then after a while, when you, know, you're, you're, you reach some sort of bottom um, and you still keep increasing the complexity of the model, you will see that um, the, the, the error on the test sample will, be, will start increasing. And so you're literally looking for the moment when um, you know, your test error has a minimum, right? So you kind of increase model complexity. And uh, as you increase model complexity, you will see that the gap in between train and test will be um, changing. And, you know, eventually it will be significantly increasing. But what you're looking for is this sweet spot when um, the test sample error is um, the smallest one. And so that is sort of the, the, the key to successful regression. And I mean, overall uh, supervised learning modeling. Okay. So, um, Today, we have had a quick introduction to uh, the retail industry and talked a little bit about uh, the problems uh, you know, that the retail industry faces and um, various analytics solutions across uh, retail value chain. And um, we looked into um, the regression modeling and how you use regression to solve, to solve some of their numerical prediction problems. And uh, on, on the seminar, we will look into uh, CLTV modeling and uh, try and practice uh, predict customer lifetime value. With that, um, we are done today. Any questions? Um, yes, hello, I... could you? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, can I ask you uh, what is the sure. uh... What is the precise, um, what does this numbers mean? Like K value and def? Like uh, what does it, does it, what do they mean in real life? Well, uh, it's I think previous slides. Uh, which one, which one? Uh, and another one, previous. Uh, and, and yeah, for example, this de depth. Oh, the depth here? Yeah. Oh, the depth here, it just really means, you know, how deep you go into the tree, right? So it is uh, how many levels you have in the tree, if I understand you correctly. And in, you know, in the real trees, tree modeling, you can have a tree of the depth of, you know, from probably, I don't know, 10 to 100, right? It's sort of depending on, on, on the model. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do we choose it in real life, for example, how... How can we go? Because you said the middle is like the best, as I understood. So it's not. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not the middle. Look, look by the way, this is a deeper tree, right? So mm -hmm. yes, when you call, when you when you when you you know do the model, um, the 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 depth of of the tree is a parameter that you provide, and so the idea is you can actually go, and that's what you do usually with um, you know the the trading, um, you know, the, as, as we discussed previously, you split the data into three parts, right? Training, validation, and testing. And so what you use, um, you use validation set to run your model with different depth of tree, right? With different tree depth, and you monitor the error. And, you know, mm -hmm. 
errors, so you increase the depth of a tree. And um, here, let's say this is a tree. So then this axis will be the depth of a tree. And um, you monitor um, the, the error you get on your test set. And you know, at some moment when you start uh, increasing more and more the depth of a tree, your air will actually start growing instead of decreasing. And so you know you pick up the depth that gives you um, the minimum air on this, uh, you know, on, on the validation set. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So you like continuously be now. I mean, of course, you don't need to go like, okay, depth five, depth six, depth seven, you can actually go, I don't know, five, 10, 15. So, you know, it, 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 it and, and a lot of tools um, allows you to do this automatically right now. So they can actually just choose for you, um, you know, the optimal depth or optimal, um, you know, the, the degree of polynomial to fit your data set. But it's important to understand how they do it. And so this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. under the Okay, thank you. And if one more question, if I can ask, sure. uh, uh, what is also value means in the previous slides, where the tree was trees was. Uh, value, I mean, yeah, you know, the value here is it means you know if we, if you if you're asking about the sort of the the um, y axis. Yes, yes value means, here. Okay, okay, yeah. So value here is just means. Um, it's what's y is equal to. So this axis is a value. So it's just, uh, you know, the, the, we have x axis, <laughs> y axis. And so this is just y. I mean, if I go back onto, um, let me go back onto this slide. So um, what it says is uh, here, you know, for every x point, for every x for a point, there is corresponding y value, right? So for x equal to 20, there is, say, for example, there is a 19, right? Or for x equal to 40, there is this data point. The y value is, you know, between 21 and 22. And so what this says is if we take all the data, the average value, average y value is 18. And mm -hmm. we split it into the left and right, and the average y value on the left will be 1998, and the average of the y values um, on the right will be 17. And so this line just shows us average y value here. Oh, okay, and samples, it's the uh, amount of points uh, inside uh, this? Correct, correct. It's just total 63 points, and uh, we got. 23 points, I'm sorry, 28 points here and 35 points on this side. And the MSE, it's uh... That's an error. Um, it's, this is how far um, it is, you know, we take this data, how far um, the, the error sort of, remember we looked, we, 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 it's the error, um, mean squared error right, how far those data points are from this line. And, uh, you know, here it's MSC computed for the entire, um, uh, for the entire data set. And, and, and uh, this is just for the left part and this is for the right part. And the definition for MSC is, uh, where is it? Here, mean squared error. Um, um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sure. Yes. May I ask an organizational question? So uh, about the exact formula of our final score, like I was told like our homeworks won't wait the same. So uh, look, I, 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 don't, I don't want to make it up right now, um, but, um, you know, I need to check what was, you know, what's in our program, right? But uh, let me answer that in the chat. We'll give the formula. All right, thanks. Sure. I think there is some other hand there. I also have a question. Uh, I'm rightly understood that we shall use uh, random forest and trees when the linear regression itself doesn't work or shows bad results. 
Um, yes. So there, you know, sort of. Let me let me explain this way. You know, linear regression is the simplest technique, and you often try to use it first because it's very easy, very sort of stable, and it will give you sort of baseline, right? Something that you you know almost get for free, right? And then. Um, what you do is you go for more complicated techniques. And today, you know, most, most the algorithm work on, on like, you know, random forest type of algorithms or like gradient boosting decision trees, but they, they give us sort of overall better performance, right? Um, but I would, you know, when, when, you, when you're trying various models, I would just sort of try to maybe progress from you know try linear regression just sort of as a simplest the most baseline model and then everything else you use everything you use after that should be an improvement if it is not then either your data is extremely simple right and it sort of looks like a straight line or you're doing something wrong uh, so if uh, with linear regression r square for example is approximately one or something like that it is not crucial to use uh, random force, et cetera. Most likely, yeah, most likely you don't need anything else. Um, but, you know, it's, again, the, today with algorithms, it, it's very, very easy to try algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're absolutely right. If R squared is close to one, then your data, and I would also, I always recommend if it's possible to visualize your data. So you kind of see what's happening. You know, if, of course, the data is multidimensional, but you can still visualize it, sort of um, select some dimensions and try to visualize it, try to understand, you know, what the data points look like. Um, again, like, look, if, you, if, if, if your data is like this, right, you know, uh, it, probably straight line, straight line might work but if your data is is like like this right um you realize it's a straight line well it's probably not a good uh match for this for this data it's better to have some some more something more flexible right to 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 match to this data so i would say and that's why here notice that linear regression gives pretty high test error um rmsc versus sort of all other methods and if i go to um where is it you know random forest eventually notice um over there the error was what one something and here it's 0.5 so it's pretty much uh, made a twice improvement right in terms of the error okay thank you sure and i think that timothy you has a hand up i'm not sure if it's yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. What I want to ask is that um, in statistics, uh, when it comes to regression, we usually uh, check our regression models for, you know, for correlation of, of the variables that we use in correlation, like uh, for multicollinearity, for heteroscedasticity, sorry, for my pronunciation, and uh, for, for instance, for some outliers in our data. What I want to ask is that uh, is it the, the common practice in the field of business to you know to test uh, your regression models in such way? Thank you. Okay. Very, yeah. Very, very, very good question. Um, so first of all, you know, with outliers, yes, you always want to see if the data have some outliers because you don't want to model outliers, right? Outliers are those data points that are like sort of far out from uh, everything else. You know, if I look at this example. You know, with, and, and and for and, and let's say, um, you know, there is a point somewhere here that looks very strange, and and uh, they, they, this this data point will screw up your modeling, right? So outliers, that's you always look. Now, in terms of checking um, the data for for collinear, collinearity, that is also a very good point. Of course, you know, you can do that, um, but. Um, what will happen is if your data, if you do have collinearity within your data, your linear regression will not perform too well, right? So you'll get just sort of results that are not very, very good. And, and you will notice um, that on a test error. So on a train error, it might do well. On a test error, um, there will be a, you know, you, you'll not get a good test error if you model with, with, this, uh, with the collinearity. So, um, 
you know, if you know how to do it, definitely do that. Um, if you do not know how to do it, that's okay. Just check uh, the model on the test data, right? Um, and yes, absolutely in business, there is always, you, you know, you always verify things many, many, many times before you put them in production. Thank you. All right. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, again, thank you guys, and I'll see you in a week. Yeah, have a good evening, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, goodbye. Bye.